I was coming back from Bilderberg Group about a month ago there in Virginia, and I was in the airport, and there were all these mindless neocon books and mainline stuff and nothing interesting, and I saw Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. And I have a friend who was an engineer at NASA and um, actually on the flight line, you know, there in Mission Control for some of the Apollo missions. And he said, running some of the RCA cameras, he said, you ought to read Dark Mission. I'll just leave it at that. Years ago, a few years ago, and I, I picked it up and I read it. And so much, everything that I had done my own separate research or run into or seen historically in mainline history, uh, you know, the occult, you name it, 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 everything Richard Hoagland was saying was accurate. And then uh, there are a lot of areas in there that's his original research. And so uh, it, it, if everything you know checks out, then it really freaks you out. And you say, this sounds credible. And uh, really a frightening book. Because having a shadow government, having an elite where they have suppressed advanced technologies, and we know they have that, they've been caught many times, who knows what's really going on? You know, that's the bigger issue is we can't trust them. And, and, and they've been caught lying so much. And his book gets into Aleister Crowley and all these people being involved in the founding of NASA, which is really mainline history the average person doesn't know, and JPL and the rest of it, uh, that I couldn't put the book down, Dark Mission, New York Times bestseller. I guess other people couldn't put it down either. And he's got a new edition of it out. And I'm telling you, this is uh, just an amazing book. By the way, I'm not selling the book. You know, We have a bookstore online, but uh, I'm not selling the book. I'm saying you, you really should get the book. And... You know, whether it's all true or whether all of his ideas are right, I don't know. But, you know, he's got quite a pedigree, and he's a really nice fellow, too. Richard C. Hoagland was science advisor to Walter Cronkite and CBS News during the Apollo program, former curator of the Hayden Planetarium and consultant to NASA. He is the co-originator, along with Eric uh, Burgress, of the uh, British Interplanetary Society of the Pioneer Plaque, you know, that gold plaque they sent out, currently carrying a message for mankind uh, on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft, and it goes on and on and on, all the things he's done in the Enterprise Institute, he heads up, and of course he's one of the most popular long-term guests uh, on Coast to Coast AM. So we go to Richard C. Hoagland uh, right now. Richard Hoagland, it is just wonderful to have you on the show with us, sir. Alex, thank you so much for inviting me, and I must say I'm really happy to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you, sir. You're the expert on all this. First, tell us a little bit about Richard Hoagland. Believe it or not, some of my audience may not know who you are. Your saga, your awakening. And then I want to get into the crazy admitted. This is something you can prove. History of NASA. Skip forward to the kidnappings and what would be murders and crazy women running around and the wheels coming off NASA, uh, as you put it. And then, and then we'll go back into the secret government and the Masonic flags and all the really crazy stuff. Well, you know, you and I and a lot of other people have had an evolution, a kind of a maturing. You know, we, we both grew up, I'm absolutely convinced, even though I don't know your story chapter by chapter, but I'm convinced you grew up like me, believing in, you know, uh, you know truth, justice, the American way, and that we lived in the best country in the world, and it was founded by people that had some absolutely. amazing ideas, and it was the freest, and it allowed people the widest diversity, and it's only as you grow older and you start asking difficult questions and you pull up the corners of the rug and you kind of look under that you realize that that is a very carefully kept facade. That, in fact, society we live in now bears no resemblance to what we were taught in school. And about all the silly and stupid things, yes, we're free. About all the important things, Alex, we're not free. And the thing that will make you free is to not believe what you're told. It's as simple as that. So when I started out, squeaky clean mainstream, you know, Cronkite, NASA, museums, science, and all that, and I came through a series of deep, penetrating questions to the belief that not only have we been lied to by NASA about almost everything that they've told us that's out there, but we've been told lies about everything that means everything to anybody. And there's almost no limit. I mean, the kind of watchword, the mantra of the dark mission, is the lie is different at every level. And I was given that by an intel officer who has been one of my dark, deep sources for years and years, who has never steered me wrong. So you're saying um, wheels within wheels, lies within lies, piled on to, the next one. To maintain the illusion. 
And, of course, this audience is well familiar with your work. So we can skip all the stuff that I normally have to do to bring people up the curve. And today it might be useful to explore why. What the hell is the end game? What's the point? Why lead people down the primrose path? Where did we go off the path? And how can we get back on the path? Because I firmly believe that we are not powerless, that we actually can change this curve, that we are masters of our own fate, captains of our destiny, but we have to wake up a lot more people. It really only takes about 2%, Alex, to change history. Well, you're right, Richard Hoagland. Can we go back, though, to your first awakenings? I mean, when did you start at NASA and at CBS and a big curator and, you know, well, designing I'm... what's sent off in spacecraft, uh, you know, a big conceptual guy? When did you start going, something's wrong here? Okay. Oh, gosh. How many hours have we got? <laughs> I was, I started out, you know, school and, and the, the museum, and, and I was, you know, a kind of a prodigy, and I was the youngest curator in the United States for a while. Of course, I grew out of that one. And I, you know, when, when you're 18 in a museum, and the mayor is calling you in for advice on how to increase, you know, revenues in the city through cultural diversity and all that, it, it gives you a kind of heady feeling you can do anything. So I would pick up the phone and I would call anybody in the country. I'd call people at NASA. I'd call people in the government. I'd call people in the, in, in, in the military, at the Pentagon. And they would answer and they would give me answers and they would return calls and all that. And I finally uh, went to a couple of museums and I was assistant curator in Hartford, West Hartford, Connecticut. And one day I got a call and the voice at the other end of the line said, My name is Frank Manitas. I'm an associate producer of CBS News Special Events. We'd like you to help us go to the moon. And like that great line in Bill Cosby's routine, I said, come on, who is this, really? <laughs> and it turned out to be Frank Benitez from CBS News. And so I went and had the most extraordinary education at CBS News from 1968, just before the first Apollo 8 mission around the moon, to the early 1970s, 71, I believe. Um, and I'm sure I learned far more than I imparted because I saw how big media works. I saw how the Tiffany Network, you know, the, 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 the legendary, you know, uh, legacy of, of Murrow actually worked in its heyday when Walter came back from Vietnam, looked into the camera and said, it's lost. And, you know, Nixon and Agnew said to each other, well, we, we, we've lost them. You know, the war has to end. If we lost Walter, we'd lost the country. I was so privileged to work with a man of integrity, a guy who actually believed the things that he was writing about and reporting on. Remember when Walter was the one dissident voice during the first Gulf War? Yes. yes. How he was, he was a voice of reason, saying all we're seeing is basically a, a scripted television plot. We're not allowed, you know, remember the, the uh, that was before they came up with the idea of embedding reporters so that they basically could watch them 24-7. Um, and there were a couple of guys that struck out across the desert and tried to find it independent information and got caught by Saddam and all that. Well, Walter was one of the only voices that basically raised questions about this rah-rah, we're going to go beat this bad guy, you know, the, the new neo-Hitler. Um, anyway, so back when I was working for him, I learned about sourcing. And, you know, I, I, I learned the journalism side. I knew the science side, but I really learned journalism at, at the feet of, of, of a guy who really was, was a master. And I started looking around, and I remember one vivid day. You, you want to know the moment, Alex, when I began to realize that the facade was not what it was supposed to be? Yeah, tell me that light bulb moment. It was, it was very early on. It was, it was critical, and if I hadn't been asked by the Cronkite people to be there and help them create this, this, this extravaganza to, to show people what it was like to go to the moon, I wouldn't have had, I don't think, the light bulb moment, or it would have come a lot later. It was on a Sunday afternoon. There were a bunch of us sitting around in Bob Wessler's office. Bob Wessler was the executive producer of CBS Special Events. He went on to become president of CBS News for a while. Then he went and helped Ted Turner set up his network. Um, which was called CNN. Anyway, Wessler was, a, was a, a child prodigy. He was a brilliant guy, very egocentric, very 
I mean, in order to be in that position, you got to be, right? Um, and we were sitting around in his office, you know, he had the cabinet open, and there was some, you know, liquor flowing around. We were just kind of watching the news conference that was supposed to be coming in from Houston uh, by, by satellite uh, from the astronauts, I forget which crew it was, coming back um, from the moon. I think it was Apollo 8. It had to be Apollo 8. So it was December of 1968. And we're sitting around, and there's, you know, a couple of producers and our researcher and me and Wessler and, you know, some people shuffling papers and bringing in stuff from the rest of the office. And we're just kind of, you know, we're kind of laid back because our correspondent there in Houston was going to ask the questions of, uh, during the uplink. This was the first time they were going to actually allow correspondents to talk to astronauts directly. Okay, I want to hear about this on the other side of the break with Richard C. Hoagland. And we're going to skip the break after that for behind the scenes uh, at presentplanet.tv. But we'll be back in just a few minutes with Richard C. Hoagland. Then we're going to get into the beginning of NASA. The three groups that made up the founding of NASA, which is a creature of the president, a creature of the executive branch. Dark Majesty. Tex Mars book getting into the whole secret government available at InfoWars.com. And a book that gets even more in-depth into NASA and how this whole empire hooks together is Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. Richard C. Hoagland, who was a consultant to NASA, curator of a major museum, designed uh, some of the things that were sent out on deep space aircraft, uh, came up with the conceptual ideas for it, and of course worked with Walter Cronkite uh, there at CBS News, is our guest. Uh, we've gotten to the point uh, where... You're sitting in there the first time your correspondent is going to be allowed, uh, or correspondent period, to talk to the astronauts when they're on the moon. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think you meant deep space spacecraft, not aircraft, right? Yes. No, deep space aircraft, deep space hot air balloons. <laughs> anyway, so we're sitting around in the executive producer's suite, because he had a big office and a suite, and it, we're just kicking back. It's on a Sunday afternoon, and we're watching our guy. Remember, NASA used to jealously guard any access to the astronauts. Uh, during the Mercury program, they had what they call the capsule communicator, the CAPCOM, who was usually another astronaut. And even the flight directors or the head of NASA normally would go through the CAPCOM to talk to the crews in orbit as opposed to picking up the phone or picking up the mic and talking to them direct. So this was a real break with this tradition. It was the first time that ordinary reporters were going to be allowed to ask questions directly of a, of, a, of a NASA crew in space during a live mission. So it was a big deal for the network, and it was a big deal for our unit and all that. So we're sitting there watching to see how it was going to play out. And NASA comes on and says, you know, I think it was Paul Haney in those days, um, well, they're, they're, we're having a small delay. You know, the, the press conference will be in 15 minutes or something like that. So we had another round, right? And then he comes on again. Well, the press conference is, we're, you know, we're, we're having a small technical problem. Um, the spacecraft is not, has risen, has not yet risen over the um, horizon at Goldstone. Goldstone was one of the big tracking stations. So we have to wait for acquisition of signal. Something about that kind of bothered me. So I literally, Alec, I literally took a, I, I, I was sitting in a chair by Wessler's desk, so I took the back of an envelope on his desk, and I started to do some scribbling, some calculations. And I looked at my numbers, and I thought, this, this is nuts. And I shoved the paper over to Wessler, and I said, Bob, I said, NASA's lying. If, if, if that's true, if what they're saying is true, those damn mountains have to be five miles high, and they're not. And it, that was the first time two things hit. One was that this agency that I believed was the agency was for some stupid reason not telling us the truth, couldn't figure out what the, what the agenda was. And then the reaction from my own you know, guy who had hired me was, oh, come on, you've got to be wrong. NASA would not lie. And this had persisted down to the present. The mainstream media, even when this agency has killed people, I'm talking Challenger, I'm talking Columbia, I'm talking bizarreness like the Lisa Nowak case, which makes no sense at all, 
unless you start asking deeper questions. NASA is a we-can-do-no-wrong agency, even when they're blatantly, flagrantly doing wrong. And that, to me, has been a mystery that still um, fascinates me, because it's like with so much demonstrable, not only just error, but deliberate malfeasance, deliberate, you know, uh, skullduggery, deliberate lying. Why does this agency maintain this pristine example of the, you know, as Reagan used to say, the shining city on the hill? And that's another question that I don't have a good answer for, but I want a lot of people to think about it, because unless we crack the facade, I mean, there, there are other institutions in this society where no matter what you lay out, people will not believe that your data is right, and the institutional um, facade or persona or manufactured image is wrong. Well, here's an example. That happened first. Uh, I, I mean, a good example is at first they would bust high-level Catholic priests, cardinals, fathers, monsignors, uh, raping children. And for decades, the police wouldn't even investigate or prosecute because you don't go after a cardinal. You don't go after a bishop. You don't go after a bigwig. Uh, I mean, that's impossible. It can't be true. And now we know about a third of them, it turned out, were you know involved or involved in the cover-up. I mean, is that a good analogy? It's an excellent analogy. And in fact, I was kind of in the back of my mind. That being a Reformed Catholic, <laughs> that was kind of what was on my mind. Wow. Okay, well, stay there. Uh, we're going to talk behind the scenes about some of the things you want to bring up. When we get back, the basic history of NASA, all verifiable, but still just amazing. Then we'll get into mind control. Are they covering up artifacts on um, the moon and Mars? A lot more. We're on the march. The Empire's on the run. Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. Hello, I'm Dr. Leonard Hoagland. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and talk to him on the scenes. Uh, Mr. Hoagland. Yes, sir. I think the interview is going great. Uh, for folks that are watching out there, I want to keep the discussion congruent, so we'll come back to the history of NASA when we return. But in the two and a half minutes, uh, we've got to... Uh, you know, tell stories. Uh, so you start questioning NASA at that point. You start saying, we're being lied to. There's no way the radio signals couldn't get over mountains unless they were five miles tall. Well, remember, uh, you're, you're on a rotating planet, so things rise and set. So they were waiting for the, the spacecraft to literally rise over the horizon of Goldstone, which is located west of Los Angeles, out in the desert there at a place called Barstow, California. And my calculation proved unequivocally that the spacecraft had already risen. You know, because we had charts and maps. I mean, NASA used to give us incredible information. No, I understand. So so then you start questioning, what was the next lie you caught him in? Oh, God. I mean, now you're looking for lies. What was the next big one you well, remember? Uh, no, uh, this, this was one of those, it's, it's kind of like if, if you have an impenetrable shield and something cracks the shield, from then on you start asking, why are they saying this? What, uh, it only takes one event. You know, swan swallows and make a summer, as the cliche goes. And it was at that point that I realized that NASA would lie. And it, it turned out later that the reason for the lie, this is what's the kicker, was so in, in, incredibly stupid and trivial. It turned out that Jules Bergman, who was uh, one of the, the correspondents, or the lead correspondent, we had, we had Cronkite, we had um, uh, Huntley and Brinkley over at CBS, uh, and then we had, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Jules Bergman at ABC, because we only had three networks in those days. Bergman wanted to be an astronaut. He did all the stuff. He went through the, you know, the, 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 the chill tanks and the whirly gigs and all the training that the astronauts had gone through to prove that, you know, it was basically the right stuff. You know, his testosterone level was pretty high. Actually, I, I knew him. He, he was a pretty great guy. He actually asked me for some information when I was pool correspondent. Sure, but what was the consultant. reason? What? Well, the reason was Jules Bergman. He w he had drunk too much the night before, and he was hung over in his motel room, and he got to the Space Center late. And all of NASA was holding this press conference to cover for Bergman being basically hung over. And that's how a lying culture starts, though, is you lie for little reasons. Instead of saying we're late with the press conference, they tell a lie, and, and, and then you start investigating and find bigger ones. 
Well, the thing was here, they were lying to protect one of their own, which which, which was a double sure. communication. Sure, here we go. Bergman, we're, going, we're going back live on the main show uh, right now with Richard C. Hoagland. Here we go, Richard. Every morning at the mine, you could see him arrive. He stood six foot six and weighed 245, kind of broad at the shoulder and narrow at the hip. The book is a New York Times bestseller, Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. For folks watching at PrisonPlanet.tv, you can see the cover of the book with the uh, Grand Masonic flag on it there. We're going to talk about that later. You can get the book at bookstores everywhere. Or, uh, Mr. Hoagland, what's the best site to visit uh, to get your book or to learn more about the huge overarching things that you're doing? Of darkmission.net. We've set up a website for the book. But then you also and have the Enterprise uh, group. I have the Enterprise mission, yes, but that's basically a huge panoply of everything. If you're focused on the book and how to get it and the discussions going on, uh, Mike Barra, my co-author, has a blog over there, and we publish new events around the book, darkmission.net is the place to go. Darkmission.net. But go ahead and plug your other sites while we're at it. Enterprisemission.com. Everything you ever wanted to know about the space program that you were afraid to ask or didn't know who to ask is at EnterpriseMission.com. Well, let's start getting into the history of NASA. You've got connections to L. Ron Hubbard, uh, Aleister Crowley, uh, Nazis, occultists. I mean, this, and then we see all the occultism and their symbols, their names. Uh, break that down for us, Richard. Well, once you start asking questions, you know, one question leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And when I realized that NASA had covered up this this momentous press conference event, basically stalled it for half an hour to cover for a, a hungover correspondent for ABC News, I then realized that, that this agency, which was supposed to be exploring space for the benefit of all mankind, was basically not above doing anything lying to, to protect one individual, or in this case, probably to curry his favor. Because if Bergman, who was going to ask the question for ABC, had not been there when this historic thing happened, there would have been holy hell to pay. And NASA was obviously, in, in retrospect, you know, skewing its entire public affairs program for this correspondent so that he would give them favorable coverage in future missions and future I years. understand, but it shows a culture of back-scratching and lying. Let's go back to well, Werner von that Braun. Gets, that, that gets into how, how are these missions covered. You know, we think of the Fourth Estate, Alex, as the kind of fourth part of government. You have the three branches. Then you have the press, which is supposed to be the watchdog group. You know that press people rate somewhere down around Congress and, and lawyers in terms of public opinion, public perception? Yes, I do, because they just sit there in little sequestered rooms uh, drinking coffee as they're given press releases, and they're kept creatures, more and more domesticated creatures, by the government. And you have the president setting up his own private agency with massive funding, running all these covert operations, and that's what I want to get into. In Dark Mission... Uh, and, and, and again, I'd separately learned this in my own historical research. This is documented, but it's so bizarre. Tell us how and why NASA got founded, and, and because that's such an important part of your book. Well, the key thing, of course, uh, goes back to World War II. You know, we had this huge war between us and the bad guys, the Nazis, um, or the, you know, the fascists, and it involved, you know, the world it involved Japan, it involved you know Mussolini, it involved Hitler, it involved huge armies and millions of, of of deaths and and billions of dollars, and it was basically you know if you kind of look at it archetypally, it was the forces of dark against the forces of light. Well, one of the things you got to realize is the forces of light were operating on the same wavelength as the forces of darkness. FDR was a thirty third degree Mason. And I started realizing that history itself, mainstream history, not just NASA, but mainstream history, with the help of, of one of my friends, Ron Nix, who's a geologist, but also has, has done a tremendous amount of work in this area, um, appears to be manipulating the, the conventional calendar, conventional historical events, according to occult and astrological signs and times and dates and moments of of 
eventuality. And an everyday example of that would be Ronald Reagan uh, to the minute when he gave a speech, what day, what he was wearing. Uh, now, uh, of course, Hitler designed it all. The modern Olympics, they're going to have it on 888 at 888 in the morning. I mean, they are really into numbers, numerology. Please continue. Well, as I was investigating, you know, as, as I went through the rest of my career with NASA and the networks, given that, that big lie on that Sunday morning, I started looking at how the press dealt with NASA, and I noticed a favoritism. You know, certain people were curried, certain people were given favors, certain people were given special things, other people were kind of excluded. You know, there, there, there was a pecking order, and, and those that were given favor we're always writing favorable stories or doing favorable coverage or favorable pieces on, on the network, be it ABC, NBC, or, or CBS. So I realized there was this incestuous relationship. So years later, when I began to ask the questions about fundamental things, like why did we land on the moon um, on July 20th, 1969? And the, and the answer was, and you could actually do this with a computer, which was accessible then, was not accessible during my, you know, sojourn with NASA. We didn't have personal computers, we didn't have laptops, we didn't have, you know, Macs, we didn't have anything that gives us, certainly didn't have the Internet, the tools to combat this, this you know, the lie is different at every level problem we're dealing with now. We basically were on our own with going to libraries. So I started, when we got the Internet, we got the computers, I started looking at launch dates and landing times, and I noticed this bizarre pattern. This was in the mid-'90s, which was that there appeared to be some kind of astrological, calendrical timekeeping behind the most important and major events in NASA's history. And more than that, certain key events, like landings on the moon with unmanned spacecraft, and then later with manned spacecraft, the Apollo program, actually were skewed to land on Hitler's birthday. And another light bulb went off. Bing! Because everybody knows, you know, it's almost, almost on school, that NASA was formed of the nucleus of the German scientist in Operation Paperclip, including the, the, the big one, the superstar, Werner von Braun, brought over to the United States you know, as our pet Nazis after World War II, after we, quote, won World War II. Well, bottom line, in Dark Mission, Mike and I lay out the case that the pet Nazis basically rose up and ate NASA for lunch. And everything that NASA's been doing has been on some kind of bizarre Nazi ritual, Thule, you know, Thule Society calendar. But you talk about, and, 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 and then even the maps, the official ball caps, the patches, uh, you, you know, then fit Everything. into all this. There's, uh, there's symbology, the patches are designed to, to reflect these philosophies. Now, what was interesting, you see, is you had three groups. We we discovered that's the key. So You've got this Alistair Crowley group. I mean, this is this is this is this is admitted, folks. Go through it. You have three groups that ultimately were vying for power in the creation of NASA when Eisenhower did it in 1958. You had the the Nazis, who of course were the the big you know 800 pound gorilla. You had the Masons. It, it, I mean, the, the Masons are kind of the good guys in in this scenario because uh, James Webb, who was a 33rd degree Mason basically tried to set up NASA to do amazingly important things to uplift education, to uplift technology, to uplift blacks in the South. I mean, there's a huge swath of democratization that goes on in the United States by, by means of Webb using NASA and NASA as a tool to help Kennedy, you know, create a, a, a social renaissance in this society to, to break out of the Ku Klux Klan and all and then, the stuff that was going on. And in the then South farm out, far, uh, use it as a unification tool, also farm out the new technologies to American industry. But then meanwhile... Uh, and to the university system. And then you got the third group, which mm -hmm. we call the Magicians, which is the Crowley Group, which was based out of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. How many times have you heard over the last 30, 40 years, Alex, news stories? JPL, the different laboratory in Pasadena, California. Which is, a, which is a laboratory basically under Caltech. So you had these three power bases, the Nazis, the Masons, and the Magicians. And Dark Mission goes through how they have vied for power 
for each of their overlapping reasons and how the program, the space program that we all have seen, is the result of the inside feudal wars between these three groups inside NASA. But that's how... Only, who only have agreed on one thing, Alex, mm-hmm. and that is that we should not ever get to see what's really out there. Exactly, the and, 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 and Richard C. Huglin, that's the nature of the New World Order. You're looking at one big pyramid, and as you know, when you pull back, it's hundreds of big pyramids that come together in that compartmentalization, and that's all it is, is these sun cults, snake cults, devil cults, sex cults, They run every major agency, and there are wars. They fight amongst themselves, but they always keep the dumb cattle in the dark, and they're all into the occult, and that's why at certain levels they get along. They recruit each other. The super globalists, you'll find, will be a a member of dozens of these groups. Uh, That is your Illuminati. It's the Babylon mystery religions, but... Your book has the evidence. Again, separately in my own research, folks, I've seen this. I can tell you it's accurate, uh, the the uh, parts uh, that we're getting into now. I'm not saying the other stuff isn't accurate. I just am not knowledgeable about some of the stuff in the book. Let's talk about the magicians first. I mean, you've got chapter after chapter on it, but let us that's, that's the part that most people, they know about the Masons, they know about the Nazis, uh, and, and again, all following basically the same esoteric stuff, but a little bit different. Let's talk about the magicians well, the magicians go back, you know, this is my name for, for what, what's in, in NASA, um, this group, go back to Aleister Crowley, who was, you know, the self-proclaimed, you know, uh, Beast 666, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the vilest man in the world, all that. Um, he was, was trying to practice literal magic in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries using mind over matter, using rituals, using esoteric rites, using, you know, sex magic, using anything he could get his hands on to basically try to change the world around him, to bend it to his will. He was one of those super guys. He was uh, in or the head of a whole bunch of groups. Well, he was in and out of a lot of different groups. He stole freely, mixed it all together. There's even now a, a new book out which claims that he was part of the British intelligence community fighting both in World War One and World War II. Um, be that as it may, he found a young neophyte in California named Jack Parsons, 